Welcome to the channel. This is Scaling for Success, and I am very excited to be introducing you to Chelsea Wood today. We are going to talk about buying businesses and selling businesses and everything that kind of goes into that that we can fit into the time period we've got. <laughs> so, Chelsea, why don't you kick us off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your past and your history and how you got to where you are today? Oh my. Okay. Um, so I'm Chelsea Wood. I am the co-founder of Acquisition Lab, which is um, an elite accelerator for people buying businesses. So we have an advisory group that really just holds people's hands as they buy a business. Um, before that, um, I, so by training, I'm an industrial organizational psychologist. Um, and so before I built the lab, I worked as a strategy consultant, often post-close, um, helping people kind of clean up after transactions had gone awry. Um, I guess in between that, I was a thought leader. So I spoke at conferences about human capital and mergers and acquisitions, um, decided I didn't want to travel anymore because I couldn't see my kids. <laughs> and that is what started the lab. Um, before I worked as a consultant, I, um, built an M&A division, uh, for healthcare system and, um, supported, I want to say 12 transactions, went through six closings and then tapped out the day we closed. <laughs> on the largest deal, as well as a few other professionals who also resigned that day. <laughs> um, and before that, I was an operational um, performance kind of coach. And then um, what did I do before that? I was a diversity and inclusion consultant because um, originally I wanted to be a civil rights attorney. Um, but... Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> when we'll, um, we'll talk I... next time, we'll have to talk deeper into that, not, not today. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that's a little bit about my background, but I've been uh, running the lab for, um, this is the fifth year. This is exciting because I love talking about m and I think it is an amazing way to create and transfer wealth. It is these wonderful people that we've got, like entrepreneurs and business leaders who take the time to take the risk, give us the jobs, provide economic productivity to our world, and then they retire or they want to exit or for whatever reasons. And so many that I encounter, they just kind of go, oh, I'm just going to shut it down. Or I didn't realize that I could actually sell that. And so this is part of why I really wanted to talk to you today, because I know that in our hearts, we're both operators as much as we have the M&A side of things. But being able to transfer that value and set up the new generation coming in for success is really important. Now, I also know that you have a Facebook group because I know that I'm in it <laughs> and it's free if I recall correctly. So that's, yeah. <laughs> that's a good thing. Um, but it's been amazing to watch the conversations unfold there. So I kind of want to structure our conversation today, starting at the, Hey, somebody's got a business for sale. I want to buy the business, but what do I need to be thinking about? And then move into the post sale piece of it, because it's not just one, you have to do the other part too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So let's take our hypothetical scenario. Um, most of the businesses that I see there are transferring in, which is probably the space that I'm in, they're more that seven and eight figure business. There's a lot that are less, not so that anybody watching this doesn't think that, you know, you <laughs> only buy um, this or something. That's not the way that works. We all say add or remove zeros at your discretion. <laughs> Correct. <interesting> for you. <laughs> Correct. Do you want to use a specific hypothetical example, pick an industry randomly and go, hey, let's talk and, and use that? Or should we just? I think it's easiest. So we are a little bit different in the sense of like, we don't typically recommend anchoring in an industry as your first step. Um, what do you mean by anchoring in an industry? So let's say you like, hey, I want to buy a business. Then the next best question that everyone asks is, what business should I buy? <laughs> right? And so Logical. Um, a lot of times people ask me, well, what kind of businesses do you think I should buy? And my response is always like, I have no idea because I don't know you. Right? And so I would never recommend buying a business based on trends. Right? Like, well, right now, HVAC is like all the rage. I don't know if you've seen memes on Twitter about being an <laughs> HVAC owner right now and having all the suitors in the world <laughs> at your door. Um, but to if you don't have the right background, skill set, value prop, value proposition um, to actually add value to an HVAC company, then you should not buy one, right? So we really anchor in figuring out what your unique 
um, kind of skills, experiences, successes that you can then replicate in a business is best for you. And unless you have some overarching strategy, like we have members that are doing a roll up in a very specific space, they'll be industry focused. But if that's not you, then there's no need to just kind of like pick an industry because you don't really know what's out there. Like I still see businesses that I'm surprised and I've been doing M&A for 11, 13 years yeah. um, and consulting. And like, I still see businesses where I'm like, oh, that didn't think that would be a business, right? And so if you pick an industry just arbitrarily, it seems kind of uh, unnecessary, right? It's an unnecessary barrier to put up. Um, we would recommend that you instead spend the time to get to know yourself, figure out who you are, what value you've historically added to businesses so that you can find a business that needs that versus find an industry. Because like, let's say you decide you want to buy an HVAC company and you have a background in sales and you want to buy a company and the they've never done sales, right? So you're buying an HVAC company They've always been word of mouth. You go in and you're like, okay, this is a great fit because I can come in and I can do sales, right? That's fine unless the owner who's leaving was an operator and you have zero operations experience because now when that guy walks out or that girl walks out, they're going to leave this giant gaping hole. You're adding sales, which is great, but you're not filling this hole. And so this is a great company for you if somebody, for example, is going to be staying and they're going to, you're going to give them equity or something to kind of keep them engaged and make sure that gap is filled. But just because the business is good for someone doesn't mean it's right for you, right? It could be a great business on paper, but if you don't, if you don't fit, like I always tell people, I view organizations as like jigsaw puzzles, right? Like I'm very much a systems thinker being an IO psychologist. And so it's very important that you understand what your piece looks like so that when you find a listing, you're like, yes, that needs my piece, right? You just covered two key points that I want to reiterate there because they are so critical. When I started my, so I've been involved in M&A inside corporate world, but I wasn't the one obviously going in and, and finding the business and defining what we were doing as a corporation. So my role there was very different. But when I started looking at businesses outside of that sort of world, that was the first question. Okay, so what do I bring to the table? What business do I want to do? But I already have a business and we're fractional operators. So I know I want to add on to that area specifically and what I'm looking for. Uh, you know, do I want things that generate more leads? Do I want things that generate more for whatever? And, and so there are things that you look for depending on your situation that could be totally different than the person sitting to your left or to your right. And I think it's really critical that you've just talked about that as well as the other piece, which is the key man risk. So we talked a lot to our clients as, as operators and talk about the fact that, you know, if they're the chief cook and bottle washer, that that's a problem. We need to fix that to make their business more saleable. So somebody coming in will not be left with, oh my gosh, I didn't realize I didn't need, I needed an operator or I needed a salesperson or whatever it was. I think growth, so two things, what you've just um, referred to, so everybody thinks about um, key man risk, but the biggest value lever, if you're thinking about selling or you're thinking about buying is transferability, right? If a business isn't transferable, then the value goes down significantly, right? So when you hear about like average multiples, you're not going to pay an average multiple for a business that's not transferable. I don't even know that I would finance a deal that's not transferable, but that's a whole nother conversation. Um, the second thing that you're talking about that I think is super fascinating is growth acquisition, right? So you have an existing business. The fastest way to grow that business is to acquire, right? Either like firms, customers, vendors. Um, and so I think growth through acquisition is one space we've started playing more in over the past, like, I'd say the last three years, the first year was very much like individuals. And then we started to really get more substantial growth through acquisition folks, right? And growth through acquisition is kind of what my background is. Um, and so figuring out the fastest way to get multiple expansion, which is what everybody's trying to do, right? When they're buying a company is grow and then sell it for a higher multiple because you add revenue and earnings. Growth through acquisition is the fastest way to do that, but it's also really risky, right? Because buying a company as a person is very different than buying a company as a company, right? There are different considerations that you have to be making, right? To to buy a company that you already have a culture, you already have people and processes, 
Now you want to buy another company that also has people and processes. That's where the culture clash that everybody always hears about with M&A comes into play. Yep. Whereas a human, like you have to worry about culture clash to some extent, but it's more about like personality and management style when it's an individual buying a company um, than it is, you know, growth or acquisition. Um, growth or acquisition is probably the most consistent strategy that our members have um, in the sense of nobody... I won't say nobody. We have like 750 buyers. So I'm sure one of them maybe doesn't want to grow through acquisition. <laughs> but most people want don't want to just buy a company and stop, right? They want to buy the company, at least grow it. Most of the strategies with growth is going to be to do another acquisition at some point. Um, and so yeah. I think it gets, I think people think that, okay, well, I bought a company, I can do it again. But they don't realize that they're not doing it again. They're doing a completely new thing right? Because an acquisition isn't a growth or acquisition. It's not the same thing, right? Buying a company and adding one to an already existing is a lot messier. Um, and then different considerations need to be taken into account. I'm going to share a story uh, oh, with that because that happened actually one of my very first experiences in the corporate world with M&A was one of those. It was growth through acquisition. So we had, we were a pharmaceutical company in the animal health space. We bought an add-on that was great, was perfect fit for us. And the owners were aging out. They wanted to, you know, well, they'd spent 20 years in the business. They're like, hey, we've got great value. Let's just walk away at this point in time. So we had acquired the company because we thought it's in this more random and remote location. Let's pull things out and move it to our main office in the country. And we can get some uh, efficiencies out of it. Great. So we go through the acquisition, we come back to the table a year later to evaluate because of course that's what we like to do. You know, you want to look back and say, did we actually tick the boxes that we wanted to? The answer was no. The answer was it was actually more efficient to leave it where it was and keep it running and humming and then add to that. And then all of a sudden we three X the company within two years, totally different experience than what we walked into it expecting for operational efficiencies. That was the reason we were buying it interesting. I think that operational efficiencies is one of the biggest motivators for growth for acquisition and it almost never works. <laughs> and I don't know why. <laughs> um, although I was just reading it, the new HBR um, when I was at the airport in May, maybe, uh, maybe May, maybe not, maybe it was a trip in July, but regardless, the new HBR talks about um, updated research on like failed mergers and they don't fail anymore. Um, and I think a lot of it is because they employ people with my background. Now that my, you know, background is more widely known, you pretty much can't find an um, a M&A team that doesn't have an um, industrial organizational psychologist as part of it, right? And I think part of the reason why these projections don't work <laughs> is because they are not realistic, right? Number one, they're anchored in historical performance mm -hmm. without recognizing the impact of change on performance, right? And it takes 18 months for change to actually take hold right in a company um and it doesn't take into account the drop right i think people talk about the j curve it's like you're going to drop in performance after a transaction almost all the time right because everybody loses focus of the business during the transaction itself and then you're inserting a bunch of change um, to the system and so it's your first priority is just to stabilize and a lot of times I look at projections and they're like, I'm going to get 10% growth my first year. I'm like, have it, has it ever gotten 10% growth ever? <laughs> Yet alone in like the most tumultuous period ever? Like, do you really think that? And I get it. A lot of people will like manage two sets of uh, projections, one for like, you know, forward facing and one for like, <laughs> this is actually what's going to happen. Um, but I'm a realist. So I feel like, shouldn't we just go in like eyes wide open and be like, okay, so we're going to drop the first year. How are we going to recover? Um, but I do, I think part of it from a growth or acquisition perspective is because they don't think about change period. Like, I don't feel like anyone thinks about how change disrupts a system, what the change journey looks like for people and all of that jazz for, for individuals. I think there's a lack of recognition that it's going to decline initially and that you just need to sit back and observe to make sure everything works for the first like six months or so. And you're just getting your bearings. And like, so realistically, the first year is kind of a wash. Um, I think you can have successes, obviously, right? But like planning for substantial growth your first year is likely going to, you know, not 
not not bode well maybe plan <laughs> for like a little bit of growth in like the fourth quarter <laughs> keep keep it stable that's, yeah that's like cool. literally you just yeah. don't want to decline like you just want to stabilize you know and so i think that when an individual buys a company um at least it, i talked to i don't know thousands of buyers at this point since starting the lab and the biggest challenge i see with the folks number one they think about buying outside of their ge geography which to each their own. Everyone can do whatever the heck they want. They're adults, right? Um, but then they forget to include the financial impact of traveling, right? So the hotel costs, the flight costs, the gas costs, whatever this additional overhead is created by traveling to a site, you know, a week out of the month or three weeks out of the month or four weeks out of the month or whatever it is, it wasn't accounted for. Um, and so they either don't account for growth or they don't, or I mean, for cost of, um, travel or they don't account for growth, right? And so when I talk to people about well, what size company should you buy, um, a lot of times there's literally no consideration for growth. It's like they have all these plans of like, oh, I'm gonna add a sales team. And I'm like, awesome, that's a pretty high cost growth strategy. How are you gonna pay for that? <laughs> I'm like, well, the revenue from the business, I'm like, hmm, have they been able to pay for sales team and pay you and is that what earnings are? <laughs> like, do you know how math works? <laughs> Like, I don't think that's how this works. Um, and so I feel like those are the two biggest um, like gaps, right? That they're not taking into consideration. And then it makes the financials not, the projections not work. So when you say account for growth, you're talking about the accounting for the growth strategies that as a new owner, you want to put into place, just assuming, hey, this is pretty cool. I'm going to go ahead and do this. It, it, that's a really interesting one to talk about because, um, the uh, owners at any stage, I find um, they need the cash flow, they need the forecast, and they need to do it properly in order to account for, well, do I have the, the, the money in the budget to actually afford this strategy or that strategy? As a new owner, new buyer, really looking at, under, at that through the due diligence process and asking those key questions would be very interesting to see what, what comes back hey, we, we wanted to do that, but we never got around to it. Well, why? I think that would be really fascinating. I think for me, one of my big, the reason our acceptance rate is so low in the lab is because I will walk through the math with everybody on every strategy call. And most of the time the math doesn't math, right? Like I'm like, so how much money do you need to pay yourself in order to sustain your standard of living? And they're like, well, 200,000. I'm like, okay, well, what size business are you targeting? And they're like 200,000. I'm like, okay, well, how are you financing the deal? Are you paying cash? Like, no, I'm, I'm financing with, with the bank. And I'm like, okay, well, that doesn't work because you have to pay back the debt, right? And that can be half of your earnings, especially in today's market. And um, actually more than that in today's market. But then we, we talk, okay, so that means you need to buy substantially larger than you were thinking. What are your growth strategies? And they're like, well, I'm going to execute a new digital marketing. Like my background is digital marketing. They've never run ads. I'm going to run ads. I'm like, oh, okay. That is a massive cost, mm -hmm. right? And like you're buying a business and you're uh, you're accounting for all the earnings currently, right? With how you're paying yourself, paying down debt. How are you planning on growing if you don't also plan for the budget for the ads, yeah. right? And so it's like, it's how much you want to pay yourself, how expensive are your growth strategies, what's the debt service, and then any additional operating costs. Maybe you need to replace your health benefits. Maybe you still want to retire. You want to contribute to your retirement. Maybe you want to pay your taxes. I don't know. Um, maybe you want to build your cash reserves back up quickly because working capital burns out real, real fast, right? And it's always underestimated. And so it's like, there's all these other things that they need to be thinking about when you're buying so that you don't get in and get cash poor, right? And either sacrifice growth or sacrifice paying yourself, right? One of those will have to be sacrificed if you're not budgeting for it up front. Which is a really interesting conversation to have. And 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 yes, you might want to consider things like paying your taxes. There could be some substantial consequences if one doesn't do that or service the debt. <laughs> I, I, mean, I find those are larger, larger pieces <laughs> aside from from conversations with, you know, the so and so's husband decided to come in and help you out and just maybe you're going to negotiate a little bit of a of a delay in payment there, but not usually with with Uncle Sam or <laughs> one would hope yes that you pay your taxes but again I, each their own i'm not here to judge you do you we're all adults. too true 
those sorts of basic pieces when you're going through and you're, so I, let, let me take a step back and say, okay, let's say I looked at a website and the website says, Hey, I've got business, you know, Acme business, ABC, <laughs> and Acme business is in the field that I want. And they're at that, the realm that I, you know, with the range that I want, and they've got the profitability in theory that I want. The next step I find, I like to look at the financials for these exact reasons, because before you even get to conversations with people, I need to understand that these financials actually, the math is math, and <laughs> to mm -hmm. use your face, <laughs> um, and, and it actually works to address the basic questions. When people do that, what questions do you find they typically either aren't asking themselves, or they, they do, and we want to say yay to that? When they're looking at financials, what questions the financials. are they asking themselves? Yes. Um, the biggest thing is, do the ad backs make sense, right? Like what is actual usable earnings, right? And I think the first question, hopefully my lab members are asking is like, what is this metric <laughs> that's being presented to me, right? Because some people will use earnings, some people will use EBITDA, some will use adjusted EBITDA and none of them, not none of them, that's, that's not incorrect, that's hyperbolic, but some of them. <laughs> are using it incorrectly, right? So like what you're actually looking at is SDE, but they're calling it EBITDA and what, you know, and that kind of thing. So you actually need to be able to look at it and say, okay, what is this number that they're showing me? Is it EBITDA? Is it adjusted? Is it SDE? So that you can figure out what the valuation is. And so hopefully that's the first question. And so if they're asking themselves that, like, good job. And hopefully they know what the answer is. <laughs> if you're a lab member, you don't know what the answer is, we should talk. Um, and so I think that's the first step, right? And then, quickly after that is like, okay, so this is the number that they're using for the valuation basis. Now let's look at how they came to that number and see if, if that makes sense, right? Like what in here is actually accurate, right? Because a lot of times I feel like the multiples are inflated by an SDE value that's inaccurate. Um, and I hate SDE for the record. I think we should be using <laughs> adjusted EBITDA, but whatever. Chelsea doesn't say SDE everyone. for those who don't know seller discretionary earnings. Yes, which unless I'm getting that wrong. <laughs> you're right. Which is basically a value. It's EBITDA and then things added back to EBITDA plus one time expenses. So like it's EBITDA plus interest, depreciation, tax, amortization. And then they add back owner's compensation and any one time expenses. Um, and so as you can imagine, that laundry list can get real long. And my favorite is half of it could be depreciation, which is not a non-cash value, right? So like the business is making 500 grand, but really 250 on its depreciation. And you're like, okay, what do I do with that? Right? Like, how is that going to impact my financials um, and my forecast? So um, ad backs is the biggest point of contention. I feel like between lenders, sellers, and brokers, right? Lenders will only accept a few um, the seller or, I mean, the buyer might be willing to accept a few more. And then the broker's like, no, accept them all. <laughs> like, <laughs> and the, like we had one listing, um, hilariously that included an OnlyFans ad back. And I was like, you couldn't have like put that as like consulting fees. Like there, there's just weird things. A kitchen remodel, for example, was an ad back, a $60,000 kitchen remodel. It's like, How does okay. a kitchen remodel get added into a business? I'm it's sorry. because they run, so many people run so many personal expenses through their businesses and they want to be able to benefit, right, twice because they're benefiting from running it through the business the first time, right? Because it lowers, lowers their taxable burden, right? right? Now they want to benefit again by saying, oh, but that, that wasn't part of the business, so like that, that's not a real expense. I want to add it back. So it looks more profitable. And cause I want a higher valuation. It's like, you got to pick, pick where you're pick the game you're playing. You can't win twice. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, and that makes it really hard, right. For, um, uh, buyers to figure out what exactly is the value that I'm basing the, the valuation on, right? Like I know I need $600,000 in earnings. This says it's $600,000, but like, 200,000 is like questionable ad backs that no one's going to accept. It's like, okay, so is it actually 400,000 in earnings? Cause then I'm wasting my time. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that earnings is like navigating what is realist, realistically available to you as the buyer is probably the most challenging. Um, and the lack of standardization also is really challenging. 
you talked about the lack of standardization there. I know I've been on a couple of calls where it's been points of conversation. Well, is it actually this formula or that formula? Is it a multiple over here or over there? And nobody's in agreement that there's, hey, there's one standard way in order to value a business. It really isn't. No, I mean, there's different approaches, but for the most part, most people are going to use a, um, a multiple or is, are going to use a multiple of earnings. And then the lack of standardization for how to determine earnings just causes it to be a complete mess. Um, yeah. And the, the buyer can say like, well, I'm willing to accept 150,000 of these ad backs. The bank can say, I'm willing to accept 100,000. And the brokers can say it's 200,000. And so it just makes for a very interesting, you know, place for the buyer to be where they're like, well, the bank is only willing to accept $100,000 of this stuff, you know, so what does that mean for me, right? And then it just causes confusion as far as how you should structure your deal um, when you're using bank financing. And Absolutely. by the way, seller financing to cover gaps, like I hear a lot where they're like, well, the seller is willing to, to seller finance the entire deal. And I'm like, okay could be because the bank isn't going to be willing to pay for that and you're just overpaying the seller but like okay like i'm glad they're willing to to let you overpay them for a period of five years <laughs> and so i do think that people um see seller financing as like this win it's like oh well the, the seller's willing to finance it a hundred percent it's like well why like as a seller there there's motivation right like some motor some sellers might be motivated for, for uh from a tax basis um, but for the most part, most people would really just want like a lump sum. If I could get $3 million and never talk to you again, that's probably preferred over praying that you don't kill my business in the next five years so that you can pay mm -hmm. me the $3 million that I've told you my business is worth, right? When in essence, the bank would have only given me $1.2 million because that's actually what the business is worth. <laughs> uh, so anyway. It's very, very interesting. The, one of the big questions that we get are the people questions. And so, okay, so I'm evaluating this business. I've gone through the financials. I know that this person, the owner, is going to leave. Now I need to try and fill that. I'm not going to fill it. I'm going to fill this portion of the, of the duties and responsibilities, but there's still this other piece. But I'm not sure what I need to do for the dollar value in that. You know, how do we address all of those elements that just come out of the basic conversations and the information on the p and I mean, there's a lot there before you even get to deep dive and due diligence and all of that. Yeah, I mean, I think the replacement costs, I, there is a, uh, I think this is kind of polarizing in the space. I don't, I don't know of those qualified and unqualified, how their d opinions differ. I just hear noise and so I don't know if it's qualified or unqualified advice but I know it's very torn some people will adjust valuation based on their own strategies and some won't okay. I am of the mindset of it is not the seller's problem that you how you're solving the business gaps that you have like the gaps you have in the business because of your own choices right the business is as valuable as the business is because of what the seller put in place right and so what I find is people will say, well, I'm not going to do this. So I'm going to subtract it from SDE. That's a you problem in Chelsea's opinion, right? That's not the seller's problem. And so if the seller is willing to let you go and like be kind and like take your d discounted valuation, then cool props to you. But like, if I were advising that seller, I would say, no, like your business is valuable for a buyer period based on this value. Right. Like if this guy is buying your company and he has a giant gap because he's not the right buyer for your company. That's that's a them problem. Right. Because the right buyer for your business likely wouldn't discount it because they could fill the gaps. Right. Or they would already have a strategy in place for filling those gaps, like promoting somebody from already within the company. Right. Giving them equity or giving them phantom equity or something. Right. They're not going to punish you for their lack of fit. Does that make sense? I love that. It makes total sense to me. In my head, and when I'm talking to people, sometimes I refer to it um, or liken it to a house, right? I'm selling a house. If the buyer of my house wants to move in and gut it and make changes, but they don't actually have the capability to do all of the changes, and they have to hire a contractor, a plumber, or whatever, that's their problem. I've sold the house. 
I got the house to where it is. To, that's the value that I bring to it. And it's, it's no different, which goes back to the word that you use the very beginning is just transferability, right? If you want your business to be worth more, you have to be able to make it easily transferable so that you can walk away and uh, have that business continue to operate without having it drop substantially Correct. when you're gone. Well, and I think there's so many things to think about that we wouldn't even have time to talk about, but one of the biggest challenges I have with transferability is the perception that they can buy a business where there was a very controlling owner in place and they can turn it around because they are an empowering leader. Mm. right? And so they view it as pos positive, right? Because they're going to buy this company and they're going to empower the workforce in ways they've never been empowered. And that's how they're going to succeed. Love that from a, hopefully everyone's quality of life gets better if they're not being berated and beaten up by their, you know, boss. However, from an organizational, um, like culture perspective, that's a really, really risky assumption, right? Like I had a client when I was consulting who a hugely successful company, I mean, they increased their prices because there was so much business and they just kept increasing their prices and everyone kept paying it because they had such a stronghold on the market. However, the founder was literally involved in every decision ever, like ever. And I mean, we're talking about, there was a, a strong management or like a defined, I won't say strong, a defined management team in place. There was a second tier of leadership underneath that. Like it from the outside looked very mature, right? But no one in that structure made a decision on their own. That entire structure always had to seek uh, approval or insight or whatever you want to call it from the owner. Someone, and they, they tried exiting to private equity and couldn't multiple times. And I think that's partially why, right? Because the entire value of that company was actually with the owner, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. with the, with this defined structure because none of them <laughs> were actually empowered to do their jobs. And as a byproduct of that, then you kind of have to look at um, human capabilities and then like, are they willing and able or uncapable or unable and unwilling like that? matrix that used to, I used to use long, long time ago, because they may be willing to do things they've never done before, but you don't actually know if any of that leadership team is capable of functioning at a higher level, right? I had another client, it's kind of similar. The owner left, they brought in a president. The president was very empowering, but what he came to realize is the management team that was in place wasn't actually skilled managers, they had never been empowered to lead or manage anything. And so as a result, he couldn't take the company forward until he built the skill in that management team, which was a five-year process. Like wow. you can't just bring them overnight, right? They had never had any autonomy. They had never had any authority. They didn't even have basic like management oversight. They just had titles, right? Okay. And so I think that there's a cultural, there's an assumption that's very dangerous right? And it's fine as long as you plan for it, right? Like you just need to make sure that you're planning for like a substantial portion of your workforce to have to turn over, right? Because if you buy a company and the, the uh, management team is incapable of doing anything, not to, of their own accord, right? They just don't have the skills. You won't be able to execute your growth strategies, right? Until you develop a management team that can support those growth strategies. And so I will talk all day about culture, so I'll shut up right now. But I just think that people need to be aware um, of that assumption because I think it's dangerous. But I, I agree. And, and that's where the, the culture clashes that people talk about uh, take more than a single form. And so being able to properly evaluate and look at the team and what you bring to the table, it isn't just our team, their team, and how do we fit it together? It isn't just me versus them. It's what's the skills gap as much as it is other things. Yes. As an, as a, as somebody who wants to buy this business, I want to know what it is I'm bringing to the table. Is it just the money because they're a solid team and they don't need anyone or whatever? Is it that I'm going to sit in a certain seat in the organization? What was it that 
the other owner had that was actually the sweet spot for them? What, what was the magic they brought? And some of those different pieces are very hard to um, properly evaluate without having several conversations. Well, I, yes, yes. And I think that there is a, I don't know if it's a confusion or just it's complicated, but culture is very much the byproduct of how the organization was run, right? And so when we talk about, are you the right fit for the company? Like if you're going to come in and be a very lenient boss, for example, right? Nobody has to do anything. That's fine unless there are people in that workforce that have been there for 20 years and they like being told what to do, right? They're used to that structure. And so when we talk about people being a flight risk, right? Or, or losing people being the highest risk in these deals, not, it's not just like, it's every choice you're going to be making about how that company runs and how it trickles down and impacts someone's day-to-day -day job that then causes that cultural friction to start. Right. Like if you're going to come in and they're, they've never had policies, procedures, no one's ever had to ask for a day's off. Like everything was very like lackadaisically run. Right. Yeah. And you're going to come in and be like, okay, I'm going to put structure in place, but you do it in a kind way. Right. Like it's not like you go in like iron um, fist at all and say, this is the way we're doing it. It's still culture change. And that makes people's, um, from a neuro um, psychology perspective, it makes everybody kind of stand up on edge, right? Your nervous system gets a lot, little out of whack. And so in turn, people become a flight risk, right? And you have to do what you can to go quell the concerns. And so you just need to be very cognizant that culture is defined by how you choose to operate. And the existing culture that's already there is a byproduct of how it's been operated historically. And so understanding operations and like understanding how decisions are made and who like the um, informal influencers are, like all of that is really important to navigate um, the acquisition. And I don't, and it doesn't become obvious until it's like, oh, shit, that's a problem. Like I, <laughs> oops, kind of a thing, right? And it's like, I stepped in it there and now I know that I should have done this differently. And so if you can be more mindful about it and due diligence, it can help you kind of um, create the, the safety net, I guess, around your strategy mm -hmm. so that you can go in a little bit more prepared. It's funny. I, I have a friend of mine who has done a bunch of healthcare rollups as well. And, and they've, uh, they've been asked by the owners to come in, for instance, at night uh, without the cleaning crew after they're done, but before the day crew comes in, because when they're doing due diligence or they're prepping or preparing the organization for a sale, they don't want the flight risk conversations. You know, there's no reason why it should impact anything else. And then as the conversations move forward, in the case, for example, of uh, the first acquisition I was involved in, you know, everybody in the organization knew that they were being acquired. I was the representative for a week down there. But it was all full interviews. Everybody got a letter saying, yes, I know you're under them. We're going to under the same conditions. You're now under us. And so the way that you handle those conversations, you know, nobody ran away. <laughs> Everybody was just fine. And then there were a few people that over the course of the evaluation over the next three to six months, you're like, mm, I don't think that person is the right fit. But it wasn't a mess. Come in, cut it out because you just didn't know yet. The, the due diligence doesn't allow you enough depth. No, the first, honestly, like due diligence is the beginning of integration planning, right? Or like transition planning, if it's not an yeah. acquisition or merger. Um, but it, I feel like the biggest mistake you can make is going in with, and again, different perspectives. Like our advisors, we have 11 advisors. We all have different opinions. That's what I love about the lab. My perspective is the worst thing you can do is go in with a with like a, here's the changes I'm going to make as the new owner. I think it would behoove you to help your workforce not feel like it's happening to them by engaging them because they know the business far better than you could possibly know the business, right? Because like you said, you don't know enough from due diligence and you won't know enough probably for the first six months until you actually get a handle on the job, on the business um, to know anything. And so not leveraging the workforce to, to make these changes and these things will actually really be hurting you in your strategy long long term 
Um, and so your, your first task is really just to observe and make sure everything works, <laughs> like make sure everything's connected, make sure that things are, you're not losing, you know, money anywhere. Um, and then you can slowly start to engage your, your workforce and helping you figure out how to move the company forward. Right. Really important to do that and take the time you're buying yeah. an existing business. And in some cases, the businesses that I've seen, they've been around for a couple of decades. It's not like you need to rush in and go, oh, I got to do this thing. And that's what's so funny to me. Like you're literally buying the historical performance. So I've talked to people that were like, I'm going to go in and do this, this, and this. I'm like, that's fine. But like, you can't make changes at the expense of historical performance because then you're devaluing your own asset, right? Like you need to make sure that you're, you're stabilizing it first. And you're not like cannibalizing, I guess, or like taking away the performance by executing on these these changes you have. Because your changes, while are, I'm sure are wonderful, we don't know that that translates to revenue. <laughs> what they're currently doing translates to revenue. So like, let's be careful here, people. Uh, protect what's what's generating revenue. That's the general rule of thumb for all business owners out there. <laughs> it, especially in that transition period, protect the revenue, plug the leaky pockets. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the other interesting things is I have conversations with people and I try very hard to let it pass on my face without, without being seen is I love those individuals who come around and they go, yeah, I heard Bob got a 49 uh, times the earnings. I'm going to get that too. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> love that. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> Unicorns are, are out there and they exist. But as my soon as somebody favorite. hears that number, oh my gosh, there's it's stuck in their head. My no, it's my favorite reason why. So everybody talks about doing proprietary outreach, right? And finding deals that are off market and getting the seller to sell to you, which it just grossly oversimplifies the mental process of selling, but that's okay. Um, but like valuation. So aside from everything, right? Whether or not the seller is actually going to sell or ready to sell or done the emotional, you know, like severing of their identity, to, right? Like whether or not they've done all that work, the the gap of valuation of like what they think this thing that they have just blood, sweat, and tears poured into, missed baseball games, missed soccer games, birthdays, right? They it it is worth so much to them that it is almost never less than a 10x. <laughs> like, even when they say, I know my business is worth isn't worth a 10x, you get to the end of the conversation and they're like, I want $5 million. And you're like, hmm, five million. That's, that's a 10X. You said you didn't want a 10X. Like I thought we talked about this six months ago. What do you mean you want? And so it's like, no matter what, that valuation gap, which is typically what a broker, you know, or an accountant or somebody that's coaching them or an exit value or exit planning specialist will coach them through, right? This is what the market is willing to pay for your business. Um, I had a seller one time that was like, well, I want to sell my business. And so we went through the whole process of selling the business. And then they were like, well, I would have made more money if I liquidated my assets. Why didn't we talk about liquidating my assets? And I'm like, because you said you wanted to sell your business. You didn't say I want to make the most money possible. You know? And so I think that there is, there's a seller, um, like off market deals, deals that are not currently for sale, won't close for a multitude of reasons. Right. And I think the valuation gap is big. Um, and then just the lack of mental preparation of like, what am I going to do once I sell? Like my grandfather held on to his business until he was in his nineties. And he, obviously he wasn't doing everything at the end. Um, but within, I don't know, a month or two of selling his business, he was in a nursing home with dementia. Oh, and so boy. like there's, there is a fundamental connection of people to their businesses, right? It is a, and I don't think that people telling everyone to like go off market is is educating enough on the time frame that it would take someone to make peace with leaving that business if they weren't already thinking about it. Well, it, it does take that that time, that emotional connection, and and I know that we've got clients, you know, they they had said at the beginning. No, nope, not, not thinking about selling, none of that. And yet, you know, six months in, they're now finally taking their first vacation in, you know, 10 years because they're like, oh, and then they came back and they're like, oh, wow, 
there's a whole other world out there. Now I'm a little more ready to talk about what that picture could look like. But it is a journey to get to, is my business saleable? Is it transferable? Have I done the things to the business that give me the maximal value? Do I know what it is I as an owner want out of this? Out of this? Is it most money? Is it that I want to sell the business? You know, what, what is this thing so that you can properly pave that roadmap? It's an interesting conversation. It is. And I don't think that people thinking about buying companies are having that conversation, yeah. right? Like, it's more like, I want to buy your business. And it's not like, should I buy your business? <laughs> like, is your business viable? <laughs> and then it's like this long conversation where you, like the, it's kind of like courting, right? Like courting a person. It's like, okay, it takes so many conversations before you even find out like the financials of that business, yet alone whether or not it's actually transferable. Then it's another period of courting to really dig in and figure that part out. And then before you know it, you're like, well, I just wasted three, four months dancing with this person that is not even worth my time. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that uh, off-market deals sound really good in theory. Um, but I just, I, I'm an efficient human. So I just I feel like it's just not for me, not primarily. I think everything should be like a moderation. So like 80, 20, maybe, but it's not for me. There's so much more I could ask, but I know we're coming <laughs> up to the end of our time. So what I would love to talk about next is a little bit more about the acquisition lab, what it is, what it, you know, how you do what you do and how people should reach out. And I, I'm going to say the links will be in the description below, by the way. That's the how. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, okay, so about Acquisition Lab. So we are structured as an advisory service, but we do have an onboarding with all of our new clients that we put them through that's a four-week structured onboarding. Um, and I kind of equate it to forklift training and manufacturing. Like I just want okay. you to know enough to not be dangerous and damage my brand. <laughs> right. And so it's like, who are you? What should you be buying? How do you communicate who you are to the market so that they take you seriously? Um, do you have financing? Let's, you know, get you set up with financing. Uh, make sure that you understand how to find deals and how to evaluate listings and how to analyze deals. Um, and so it's a very structured process. Um, at the end of it, you end up with your buyer profile from our branding advisor, a pre-approval letter from a lending partner, um, and then the frameworks to use to evaluate listings and um, analyze deals. So that's kind of the structured four-week process. It's done, uh, I still do live workshops, uh, not because I love, I've been through 46 cohorts at this point, oh um, <laughs> but it's because I know people, I know us as adults, and we will not do this work if I don't make you do it because it's the soft stuff. Um, and so we still do, there's our seven workshops, six are live. One is pre-recorded like fully. There's no live workshop because it's just heavy on, you know, if you want to work with the SBA, what does that mean? Um, and then, um, there's pre-recorded content that drops on Thursdays that I do know they'll watch, which is like analyzing deals and evaluating listings. Like everybody wants that. <laughs> so I can trust they're going to watch that. Uh, it's not so much of like, what are your, um, you know, saboteurs on how your brain processes information and how's that going to show up in the deal? I don't think they're going to do that on their own. <laughs> and so I make them come meet with me <laughs> in a small group and we go through it together. Um, and then once that's done, then once you're actively searching, you get access to our advisory group. And we have um, seven advisors that take office hours. Um, one that does uh, questions only in Slack. And so we actually have office hours once a day, at least. Uh, we have them twice on Tuesdays. All of our advisors have bought and sold multiple businesses um, in different ways, um, in different spaces. And so um, the intent is that no one's ever alone. No one's ever spinning, looking for answers. They can always access somebody um, to give them um, answers. And so you also get access to um, uh, like market and um, industry research. I didn't think anybody would pay for that. And I think database decision-making is important. So we cover a year's uh, subscription to that. That's like four grand. Um, I really wish we'd stop covering that. It's really expensive. <laughs> um, we have a 25. But it is percent. important. <laughs> it's so important that I won't stop covering it. I I'm renewing today, actually, and I haven't signed it because I'm like, ah, I hate it. It's our highest overhead. Um, and then we do a 25% discount to valuation software so that you can see what comp multiples are in the market. Um, I have negotiated a discounted due diligence package for our members because many times they try to cut costs on due diligence and they're not doing QEVs, which aren't always important, but when they are, they should be done. And so our members can get a QEV for like 12 grand. 
um, like a full Q of E plus actually, uh, which I think is amazing. Um, they're normally 25 grand for anyone that doesn't know what a quality of earnings report is. Um, that's it. And it's lifetime access. And we do a live deal review call every other Tuesday. Um, and that's typically once you've um, gotten a deal, you're seriously considering it, then we can talk through kind of how to structure the deal. We can tear down the deal with you, Walker and I. Um, and, you know, 60 to 70 people listening. <laughs> you're, you're close to 60 to 70 friends. <laughs> yeah. And so um, they're always really great. So one of the things we can do is pull everyone and say, like, would you run from the deal? Do you love the deal? Or like pull on questions that somebody has um, and, and get everybody's feedback as well. So that's it in a very very large nutshell. I, I love that. And so we're going to make sure that the link is in the description below, because I know I have met a few people who've gone for the acquisition lab and they absolutely could not say enough great things about Chelsea and the experience and everything that, that you, they wind up getting and they've made purchases. So yay. I know. <laughs> I'm very, I'm very grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Chelsea, thank you for your time today. I really do appreciate it. Super important topic and conversation given the transfer of wealth that we are sitting at, at the moment with everybody that's an aging boomer and those aging Gen Xs and all of them wants to transfer that over, you know, next generation. It's really important. That's true. Onward. <laughs> Onward and upward. I love it. Thank you all. Thanks.